This is an e-learning video from Anasazi Instruments. The topic for today is relaxation. Our objectives for today include learning how to read pulse programs and why relaxation delays are important, different relaxation mechanisms that need to be looked at in order to get good quantitative data, and how to measure T1 relaxation times. First thing we're going to do is learn a little bit about pulse programs. This graphic is a typical 1D pulse program. The relaxation delay is the first step in any NMR experiment. During this time, the nuclei are prepared to be altered by the effect of the pulse. A radio frequency pulse excites all the nuclei in the sample. For doing proton NMR, it excites all the proton. If you're doing carbon, it does all the carbon. The pulse width is measured in microseconds, but re usually referred to in terms of a tip angle. It wouldn't be unusual to see 90, 135, 180 degree pulses. Data is collected during the acquisition time, and the digitized signal then gives the free induction decay. In the graphic above, we see a slowly decaying sine wave, which would be typical of a one resonance molecule like water. If there's multiple resonances, you'll see constructive and destructive interference making many different patterns. After a scan completes, the nuclei need time to relax back to the original state. The relaxation delay is what allows the magnetization to recover before you pulse it again. The cycle time, or scan time, is how long it takes to accomplish one scan of an NMR experiment. It can be approximated as RD plus AQ, both of which are measured in seconds, while again the pulse width is measured in just microseconds. If you're doing a multiple scan experiment, the cycle time times the number of scans will give you the total time for the experiment. Now, when you're doing qualitative work, the relaxation delay doesn't matter quite as much. You're just looking for chemical shifts, coupling constants, multiplet information such as doublets, triplets, quartets, and so on. However, when you're doing quantitative work, longer delays are used so that you get accurate integrals. Similarly, many 2D experiments depend on the T1 relaxation time so that the NMR pulse program works correctly. So what exactly is T1 and T2 relaxation? Let's follow a pulse program and see what's going on with the net magnetization vector during an experiment. So before the pulse width, this is during the relaxation delay, the net magnetization vector is aligned along the positive z-axis. After the pulse, the net magnetization vector is tipped into the xy plane. Only magnetization in the xy plane can be observed in an NMR experiment. We can't see net magnetization aligned along any part of the z-axis. The nuclei begin to precess in the xy plane and the intensity of the signal decays over time. This decrease in the magnetization vector that's in the xy plane is called transverse relaxation and its measurement is called T2 relaxation. At the same time, there is an increase in the net magnetization along the z-axis. This is called longitudinal relaxation, and its measurement is called the T1 relaxation time. Both of these are going on simultaneously. When the acquisition is complete, further relaxation can occur during the relaxation delay. You want the magnetization to be back exactly where it was before the very first pulse, before you do the next pulse. Let's talk a little bit about relaxation mechanisms when we're doing proton and carbon NMR. Protons and other nuclei can be thought of as tiny magnets with a north and south pole called dipoles, and their magnetic fields interact through space. This is called a dipole-dipole interaction. Protons and carbons are both spin one-half nuclei, 
and help to relax other spin one half nuclei. So while protons are mainly relaxed by the dipolar mechanism, we want to know what influences this. There are four major factors that influence the strength of this dipolar interaction. The two most important factors for solution NMR are the distance between spins. We may have intramolecular relaxation, and if there's other molecules nearby that have protons, we'll have intermolecular relaxation. Similarly, the way that a molecule moves in solution, how it can rotate about its axis makes a big difference. So let's talk a little bit about the difference between spins. The dipolar mechanism has a factor of 1 over r to the sixth, and the r is the dipole-dipole distance. The closer that a protonated molecule is to another, the greater the relaxation rate. The concentration of a solution can have a tremendous effect on the relaxation. So what is the likelihood of intra or intermolecular relaxation based on concentration? In a dilute solution, the solute molecules are surrounded by solvent, in this case CdCl3. This system will have mostly intramolecular relaxation. Contrary to that, a neat solution, the solute is surrounded by other protonated solute molecules. The same intramolecular relaxation will occur, but a much larger amount of intermolecular relaxation is also going to occur. On the other hand, molecular motion also has, plays a factor in this. If we assume a spherical molecule, the rotation about any axis is going to be the same, but as a molecule gets bigger, the rotational motion around the three axis may differ. If a portion of a molecule is rigid, like a benzene ring, it may move easier or rotate easier along one axis while rotating slower around another axis kind of like rotating a frying pan in water. On the other hand, an alkyl group, which is not rigid, is free to revolve and rotate about even while the molecular motions are slow. This is going to make this part of the molecule relax a little bit faster, possibly. This can flop about even while the motion of the larger molecule is slow. This will be a little bit faster. Knowing the relaxation rate for different parts of a molecule will help to ensure that integrations are accurate and possibly save valuable time on the NMR spectrometer. So how do we measure this T1? If we need to know this for an experiment to run successfully, we need to be able to get at what the T1 is for different resonances within a molecule. This experiment is called the inversion recovery experiment and commonly referred to as the 180 tau 90. And it will help us to determine the longitudinal relaxation time. The magnetization starts out aligned along the z-axis just like previously. We pulse with a 180 degree pulse and this inverts the spin populations. We see the net magnetization along the minus z-axis now. We wait a short time tau, in this case 0.2 seconds. You see the magnetization vector has decreased a little bit. We give it a 90 degree pulse and transfer magnetization into the xy plane. Notice that we pulsed it clockwise along the minus y-axis and our peak is pointing down. We'll run the same experiment again. We wait a time so that the magnetization is along positive z, invert it with a 180 degree pulse. This time we wait a little bit longer and we notice the magnetization vector has shrunk to be a little bit smaller. When we pulse this into the xy plane, we get a little bit smaller peak than we previously did. We run the experiment again. This time we'll wait a little bit longer. Our net magnetization has gotten smaller we pulse it into the xy plane, we're getting smaller and smaller signal. We keep doing this several times. Here we've got a positive peak. We run it again, we run it again, and we keep doing this until the last couple experiments 
are fully relaxed experiments similar to if we had just run a 1D experiment. So what are the results of this experiment? When we go to process the T1 data, for each resonance of a molecule, we can calculate a different T1 relaxation time. But even just looking at this array, there's a little bit of information that we can garner. Notice the middle spectrum. Some of the peaks in the middle spectrum are already right side up, and some are still inverted. If we look at the structure of this molecule, we'll see that this is propyl benzoate, and the different resonances are part of the benzene ring on the left and the alkyl group on the right. If we look at the T1 times, we notice that the T1s for the alkyl group are significantly smaller than the T1s for the benzene ring. This is to be expected a little bit because of the molecular motion. So different resonances within a molecule can have vastly different relaxation rates. If you're going to be doing some experiments that require knowledge of T1, you'll be wanting to run the T1 uh, experiment, the inversion recovery experiment, so we can get accurate T1s before starting an experiment. So what have we learned today? We learned a little bit of how to read pulse programs. We looked at a 1D pulse program and an inversion recovery pulse program. We talked a little bit about the dipole-dipole mechanism and how bond distance and molecular motion affect the relaxation rate. And we learned to analyze uh, an array and measure the T1. Thank you for your time.